Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing. You know my name yet? And Anthony Lionheart Smith. Harrington, how we doing? I'm doing excellent, Michael Bisbing. How are you, sir? I am very, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, big show plan today. We are going to be joined by the bantamweight champion of the world, the man that just put on one of the best performances I think that we've seen in recent memory. I am, of course, talking about Sugar Sean O'Malley. He'll be joining the show. Also, we got UFC 300's Bo Nickel. He will be with us in just a minute. Until then, and I'm talking about four minutes, guys, so don't turn off the podcast right now. Uh, you got about four minutes of me and Harrington. <laughs> Bo Nickel's going to join first and then Sean O'Malley. Harrington, as always, a pleasure. Brian in the background, thank you very much. Harrington, I've seen what you put in number one on, in the notes. And to mm -hmm. be fair, it's kind of a big story in MMA, although I'm not 100% convinced. I am, of course, talking about the notorious one. Conor McGregor. The floor is yours. Uh, so he's been, you know, on he went on the MMA hour as well as a number of other places, had like a long sit down interview with Brad Okamoto. Pretty much anybody, you know, with a microphone in the MMA space has spoken to Conor McGregor this week. Uh, and he said the same thing in every single one that he is back. He has talked to the UFC, ready to get rock and rolling uh, for a fight this summer. So. so so I'm very happy where I am now. Mike, the call has been made and we're a go. So, you know. This what does summer, that mean? What does that mean? The call has been this made. This means this summer the Mac is back. So Let's I'm happy go. with I'm happy with my time I've got in the lead up to it. I'm happy with where I'm at, and everything just works out in God's name. And I'm excited right. where I'm at. We don't want to get demonetized by Ariel Helwani. <laughs> um, I'll say this: he's looking a little slimmer. He's looking, you know, not quite as bulky. He says that he got the call. So the call that I assume that he's talking about will be a call from the UFC saying, listen, everything's good. We're ready to book a fight. We, um, you know, there's no USADA issues. Remember, that was kind of a, a, a stumbling block for a while. He had to do the six months and all the rest of it. However, we have heard this before. He did say that he was coming back at 185 pounds against Michael Chandler. I, I think off the top of my head, there's been two or three times that he said this. I guess... When we get an announcement from the UFC, that's when it will feel a little bit more real. I don't assume that he's lying. He's not talking out of his ass, but he's done this before. He said that he's retiring before as well, many times. You know, fair play, he's doing the rounds right now, promoting Roadhouse. A lot of people saying good stuff about it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, but Saturday night, there's a big night of fights. Is it Rose Namajunas this week? Rose Namajunas versus Amanda Hibas. Amanda Hebes, that's a good fight. Um, so if Dana's there, he will no doubt be asked about this. So I guess we'll get some clarification from the UFC Saturday night. Uh, but when he says sept uh, summer, does that mean International Fight Week? Does it mean August, July, September? I mean, you know, I don't know. It could be a few months away yet. Yeah, I mean, there. You know, you 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 are leaving yourself a pretty big window to to sneak in there. But I mean. With everything that he said, I would have to imagine he's still targeting that uh, uh, end of June card. You know, the yeah. I think it's three hundred three International Fight Week. Is it really okay? Whatever three hundred three International Fight Week. I haven't been marking them down, counting them off. I haven't been, you know, <laughs> counting down the days. Really, Although you don't I have your UFC pay per view advent calendar? I do, I do, <laughs> and every day I, I strike one off. It's like woohoo, <laughs> let's go! Um, but UFC three hundred just around the corner. I'm excited for that one. That's going to be a landmark event. Bo Nickel jumping on the card shortly. Jamal Hill, top of the bill. So we're going to talk about that stuff. We've got a few little fun non-MMA stories as well. But uh, Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler, okay, let's just take his word for it. It's going to go down. What's your early prediction there? I think it's going to – listen, Michael Chandler, I did a video yesterday. I mean, this guy's been waiting. He's been lifting. He's been running. He's been meditating. He's been manifesting. He's been doing anything that ends in an ing. He's been doing it. Do you know what I mean? Poor old Michael Chandler has been waiting in the wings. He's been waiting. What else has he been doing? He's been lifting. He's been uh, pontificating. He's been YouTubing. He's been interviewing. A bit of commiserating every now and then. Commiserating for sure. <laughs> he's been promoting on WWE Raw. 
<laughs> you know, there's a few more ings. Whatever it is, <laughs> poor old Michael Chandler has been doing it. Um, so, you know, he's kind of hittable. McGregor does have good hands. It's going to be an interesting fight. Is he going to be in condition? We don't know. You know, that remains to be seen. Um, what else have we got, Hamilton, while we wait for uh, our good friend Bo Nickel to jump on? Well, it also remains to be seen. Uh, I thought this was just an interesting talking point about it. He said, I'm not sure if I want to do a three round or a five round fight. Um, he said, I might just want to come in and do a three rounder to get my beak wet. So I'm wondering, could that mean he's willing to take a co-main event spot? You know what I mean? And just have that three round fight versus a special three round main event. That seems weird. Yeah, I, I, I can't see that. I mean, listen, Conor McGregor makes history. You know what I mean? McGregor, if, they, if they'll do it for anyone, it will be Conor McGregor. But I, I just don't know. I just don't know. It's interesting that he says that. Obviously, that would have me thinking. I mean, it's you don't have to be a genius to extrapolate this, that he has cause, uh, concerns of his conditioning. That's what that would lead me to believe. But the opponent doesn't change. You know, three-round main event, that's old school. When did they start? When, when did they change it to five rounds? I don't know what year that was. I'm going to take a guess and say 2014. 2014? Is, do you know that or are you literally it's guessing? Literally a guess off the top of my head. I think it's probably around there. No, no, but when I fought Vito Belfort 2013, that was a five-round fight. Oh, okay. So I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. The game what, plan what was, you, you know, Vito with his big muscles, pin him up against the fence, make him wrestle, get him tired, then take him out in the later rounds. Great plan. I said to God. Bing God in round two. So, <laughs> it's, uh, what you it says here, June tenth, twenty eleven, was the the day or two after he announced it. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Rose Nama Yunus, we're just filling in a moment while we wait for Bo Nickel. Hopefully, he doesn't let us down. Bo Nickel seems no, far not. too. Oh my God. Speak of the devil. There he is, and he shall appear. I was literally just saying, about to say, Bo Nickel doesn't strike me as the kind of guy to let one down. You know what oh, I mean? No. You seem like a very dependable guy, Bo. <laughs> yeah, I try to be. I try to be for sure. It's that wrestling mentality, the discipline just built into you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I didn't really realize that people were late to practice or missed. <laughs> like, I, that was never really an occurrence to me until I started fighting MMA. And now I'm like, Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. But I don't yeah. know. Not, not my style. <laughs> well, well, no, exactly. You know, in the wrestling room, you know, it, that, that will not fly. But uh, I'm sure at this point now, you must be accustomed to Brazilian time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I am. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I have uh, two Brazilian coaches and they're like, I think the anomalies because they're always ready to go. So I think uh, oh, I'm, I've been fortunate. Okay. I've seen other people uh, and, uh, it's definitely, it's its own thing for sure. They're, yeah, yeah. Problems. No, it used to piss me off, man. It used to piss me off because I would drive when I was back in England. It was like mm -hmm. a, an 80-minute drive to the gym and I still get there on time. And all the people that lived like five, 10 minutes away, they'd rock in like 20, 30 minutes later. I'm like, yeah. what, the, what the hell are we doing, guys? Right. Anyway, Bo, thank you for joining us. I appreciate your time today. Uh, how is preparation for the big UFC 300 going? Prep's been great. You know, I feel awesome. I think that... Uh, it's been, um, you know, obviously a long time since I was able to compete last. And I think that's been a really good thing for me um, just to continue to grow and develop and mature as a mixed martial artist. And, uh, you know, just with everything happening as fast as it has, um, you know, that time has been really, really beneficial for me. So I feel uh, really just excited to compete. I think I've made a lot of gains and improvements and yeah, just, you know, all healthy and everything. So Feeling, feeling grateful for that and just excited to get out there and fight again. Yeah, July 2023. Sorry, I was just looking up the fight card there as you were talking. So what? it's going to be, what, eight, nine months or so? So that is quite a break. It's certainly when you're starting off your career. What has been a big focus for you in that time? You know, I think just overall development, right? Like um, because of how quick my trajectory has kind of shot me up um, into – where I'm at in my position uh, within the sport, I feel like I just needed time to let my other skills develop. You know, of course, striking's a, a big part of that. So I've been working a lot of a lot of striking, but mostly just like fundamental stuff. You know, I think that um, people a lot of times developing maybe skip the fundamentals of a lot of certain different aspects of of you know 
of combat sports when you're in MMA because it's like, all right, well, like this is how to throw a jab. And then all of a sudden you're sparring. And I don't know that that's necessarily the best way to get better quickly and improve. So for me, it's just, it's always back to the fundamentals. And that was actually something for me that I had to relearn getting into collegiate wrestling. I was always a really good wrestler, really competitive. I knew how to win, but you almost have to relearn the fundamentals um, when you get to a new level. And so for me, I try to take that same mindset and apply that to now I'm learning boxing and kickboxing and Muay Thai and jujitsu. And then I, and then it's my job to take all those fundamentals and all that solid technique and figure out how to blend it and combine it to make it work for me in a mixed martial arts fight. Right. Cause at the same time, while it's good to know the, those fundamentals and the, the basics, it's still MMA. Yeah, no, for sure. The fundamentals, they're often so overlooked because people want to do the spinning wheel kicks. They yeah. want to do a flying knee. They want to do these big outlandish, you know, show stealing moments or, or moves, should I say. Um, as you were saying that, I thought about this. Have you noticed, and I don't expect you to criticize mixed martial arts training, you know, because it would seem elitist of you. But the, where, where I'm going with this is, so you've been a, a wrestler at the highest level you pretty much your entire life. Wrestling has been around for a very long time. So I'm assuming there is a tried and tested, proven method of how to train wrestlers. You know what I mean? You do your drills, you do your, you do your warm-up, you do your drilling, you do your lives, you do your situational stuff. Mixed martial arts, with it being such a young sport, um, I've experienced good coaches, bad coaches. I've experienced coaches that don't really know what they're doing. I've experienced coaches that are kind of making it up as they go along and they're kind of lying to everybody in the room. What has been your kind of experience in that regard? And have you had any frustrations along the way? Oh, for sure. You know, I think that initially getting into it, you just really don't know who actually knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. And so for me, there's been um, just a learning curve of, of trying to figure that out. And I think that when um, <laughs> I look at coaches and people that I respect and want to listen to, they, they all have one thing in common and that's like a system, right? So it's, yes. it's, it's very like they, they analyze and they collect data and then they have a system of how they're going to go about whatever it is they're coaching and positionally, you know, teach people kind of con conceptually rather than like, all right, this is going to be the combo today. We're going to throw a jab, cross, hook, and then shoot. It's like, well, that's not how a fight goes. It's not choreography. So, but when you have a system and when you can kind of think about it positionally, that's when I, I, I just, it clicks to me. And I feel like that guy, that coach is somebody that I trust and I, who I feel like knows what they're actually talking about. And so that's, I think, in wrestling, kind of a standard, right? Like there's a lot of different systems for different programs and um, different coaches, but it's like they all have, a almost a curriculum of sorts that they teach and they go over um, stuff year in, year out, whether that's with guys that have been in the program for a long time or new guys coming in. That's how it was for us at Penn State. We all have um, certain positions that we're going over and training on a very regular basis. And, uh, you know, so, so that way it just takes a lot of the guesswork out. Mm, mm, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you're five and oh, still, still very, very young in your career, but it seems like you, well, you're a smart guy. It seems like you've got a good head on your shoulders and a good understanding of the game and what you're saying there about systems and things. One of the things that is a big challenge for fighters is when you're in a fight, it's such a high adrenaline moment. You know what I mean? You're always talking about calming yourself down. I used to try and get angry and mad, which I learned through trial and error is not the way to be. You want to try and slow it all down in your mind. You know, how are you when you're in there? It's only five fights. How mm. in control of your emotions are you at, at, at this stage of your career? I feel really relaxed and really calm. And I think that, you know, while I've only had five fights, I think that just is through thousands of wrestling matches and, you know, competing. Um, something that's really cool, the NCAA wrestling tournaments this weekend. And, you know, so I'm kind of yeah. watching on television and stuff. And these guys are going to wrestle. The guys who win are going to wrestle five matches in front of 30,000 people across three days. So, you know, that's, that's to me more than enough preparation, um, to keep a cool head in a, yeah. in an MMA fight. And it, it is, a, it is more pressure and it is more intense uh, MMA for sure. But I feel like, um, because I have that experience with me, I feel prepared for it. Right. Like that's something that I think I'm head and shoulders above the rest of my competition, as far as like how to keep a level head in those intense moments. 
because no, just nobody has that experience like I have. And it, it just, it was something that I was used to as a kid in high school and college, just big matches, big crowds, environments, and now it's just another step up, but I feel prepared. So let me ask you this and don't take this the wrong way. It's a question. Uh, there is not an accusation or anything. <laughs> In fighting, you got to be able to be the hammer and the nail at times. So mm-hmm. far, you've been the, the hammer every single time. Round one, round one. All five wins are in the first round. How do you think, I mean, I, and for your sake, I hope it continues like that. You know, that's <laughs> what we all want. But you, you, one would think at some point you're going to run into a bit of adversity. Someone's going to be able to, you know, give you a good test. You know, you're not Superman at the end of the day. Have you thought about that? I mean, are, are you able to take a kick in and keep on ticking? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that um, initially, uh, you know, of course, I want my my hardest training moments and competition, uh, or excuse me, my hardest moments and uh, tr- to come in training right, rather than mm-hmm. competition. So yeah. that's why I'm putting myself in environments like American Top Team. I was able to spend a few weeks oh, down, nice. down in Florida for this camp. So, you know, I'm training with some of the top guys in the world, um, Marvin Vittori, Johnny Eblen, guys like this who are extremely seasoned and have fought the best of the best. So, you know, I think that um, <clears throat> for me- going I bet to- they hate, I bet Marvin hates going with you because I know <laughs> Marvin, he's a friend of mine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. nickel in the room is like, oh, for crying out loud. Listen, we want to get better at takedown defense, but I want to get some work in for crying out loud. You know, I think we're great for each other because, you know, <laughs> while obviously I have a wrestling edge, he's just got such a, you know, experience in, in MMA overall, you know, fought for the belt. And that's something that is super valuable. So I think we're, we're really good for each other and uh, we can help each other maybe where uh, the other person lacks a little bit. So. Those are the type of environments I'm putting myself in. And that way, hopefully, you know, people say the cliche, right? Like train hard, fight easy or something like that. But um, for me, I I honestly kind of am like excited for the idea of somebody being able to make it past the round with me or to like hit me or just, you know, put me in a position where I have to like, I, they resist me a little bit because it's literally been zero resistance for my whole career. Um, So for me as a competitor, as somebody who I'm doing this sport because I love it, because I enjoy it, I, I want to continue to get better and improve. Like I want to feel that adversity and I want to feel a little resistance. So, you know, hopefully um, my next opponent can do that. And at least I, I would love it if I could make it to the second round. So um, for me, that's something I'm looking forward to more so than uh, than dreading. I want to I, I want to be I, not that I want to get hit like, no, you know, getting hits never yeah. fun. And but I want to feel like some type of resistance against, because it's just, that's going to happen at some point. I have no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm smirking here. Not because, uh, because of the audacity of you. It's because I know what you're capable of and I'm not kissing your ass or anything like that, but it's an unusual, um, desire. You know what I mean? I want to meet the man that can push me or even get me to the second round. And as I say, I know you're not saying that from a position of arrogance. You're just aware of your capabilities. So talk to me about, uh, Cody Brundage. Cody mm-hmm. Brundage, he's, he's a big, strong guy. You know, last time he took out Zachary Reese, it was a slam in the first round, took out Jacob Malcoon before that. Um, yeah, how do you assess this guy? Yeah, I think that, you know, he has a he's a, he's a dangerous opponent. Um, I think he's a, a step up from the competition that I've had in the past, which is good for me. I want to continue to take incremental steps up in competition. You know, he has a few UFC wins, and obviously a lot of people have seen uh, his last fight with a slam knockout and he comes from a wrestling background as well so he's yeah. a collegiate wrestler so i think that he um poses uh, a few problems um that maybe i haven't had to deal with in a real fight before um that being said i feel like i'm very well prepared for this and uh going into the fight um just a guy that you got to respect um because he has big power he has you know like i said a slam knockout he has a knockout off a counter punch um he has knockdowns on um multiple guys like in the ufc so definitely big power but at the same time i think that um for me i'm definitely i have better cardio um i feel like i fight a little bit um more intelligently and i think i'm honestly you know he's probably been fighting quite a bit longer than me but i think i'm much more well-rounded even considering uh i'm less experienced so i feel like wherever the fight goes i'll be uh, prepared for that and you know my style is go for the finish so um position i'll be in there making sure i don't just don't see him lasting with me for too long but um i think wherever the fight goes i'll be ready to 
you know, just continue to be in good position and then finish the fight, whether that's on the feet or on the ground. Yep. And I look forward to that test. Um, you must have seen a little bit of negativity from people talking about the position of you on this landmark event, right? I mean, pe people are going to hate, right? They talk shit just for the sake of it. What is your take on all of this? You know, I think it's kind of funny. Um, I just uh, feel like it's weird that people would be mad about that um, just because it has nothing. To, it's not my decision. So, you know, you could be mad at me for where I'm at, but it doesn't change it really. And uh, you know, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, you know, compete on this card. It's an amazing card. There's so many uh, amazing fighters. And I just feel like the fans don't realize a couple of things. One, no matter where you fight on the card, like you're getting paid the same and the pay-per-view costs the same, like you're still going to be able to watch the fight. It doesn't really matter. It's a good like, point. Unless your main event or co-main event, like it's kind of a wash. So if they put me first card on or first fight on the prelims or, you know, wherever, I wouldn't really care because I just want to fight. And uh, mm -hmm. I would actually rather go earlier. That way I can get home and, uh, you know, just enjoy my evening and not have to be out so late. But uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I think the benefit of being on the main card is, you know, my opponent won't have ever really experienced something like that. You know, I've already been on the main card in two UFC fights, two big events as well, 285 and 290. And uh, so, you know, I know what that's going to feel like. And I think that's just another tactical advantage for me. And it's interesting. A lot of people um, have said a lot of things before my fights, but whenever I get in the arena, it seems like everybody's cheering for me. You know, maybe that's all I hear, but it just, that's yeah. what it seems. <laughs> No, 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 no. I agree. The, the the last fight when you walked out, in fact, both of them, actually, the two on pay-per-view, mm -hmm. whenever you walked out, you got a good pop. You know yeah. I mean? You've definitely got the American fan base behind you, and rightly so. Um, as mixed martial arts, you no, know, in fact, before I get to that, I'll ask you this. Um, there doesn't seem to be any controversy around you. There's no shit talk. Yes, of course, you're confident in your abilities. You know, at what point do you think, you know, what would somebody have to say to really get under your skin to win? You know, to, to have Bo Nickel kind of lose his shit a little bit. I don't know, you know, I, I don't really... You're, you, like, you've got the whole, I'm representing America. You know, like if you're traveling international with the wrestling team, you're representing your country and, you know, you've got that whole vibe. But what if you're at a press conference and someone says something about you? You know, listen, I'll show you in the <laughs> ring. At what point do we get that Bo Nickel? You know, um, I feel like... I'm not sure. I feel like, again, I'm like you said, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I, I keep it pretty classy. Um, and there's no doubt that at some point somebody's going to try to get in my head and this and that. But I feel like, you know, that doesn't really have any effect on me. Like, because I don't fight. I just fight because I love it. I fight because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It's because it's what I want to do. I, there's a lot of different things I could be doing right now. But um, I guess if, you know, it, it just to me, when I get into the ring, it's it just emotionless. Like, it doesn't matter who my opponent is or what they've said. I, I want to win because of my own internal motivation, not to beat any yeah. any guy or because they say anything. So anybody, they, any any um, shit talk or whatever that somebody could say, it's, it's really pretty irrelevant to me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's not really... It's just not relevant. I, I don't know. Sure. I'm here to win yeah. the fight and I'm here to be, you know, the UFC champ and the pound for pound number one fighter in the world. Everything else to me, it, it means nothing. So when I see an opponent across, it's just like a body that I'm going to go like maul. It doesn't even matter. It's not personal at all. So again, like this, this next dude, I'm super happy and grateful that he signed the fight. I, I really wouldn't, I don't understand why guys are agreeing to fight me. Hopefully the UFC is paying him well. <laughs> And, you know, hopefully they can just see, 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 that's really good. Yeah. Uh, passive aggressive shit talk right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like, I'm, I'm just like, I don't know. Like, what do they, what, what do so, they expect? Why did these guys take this fight? I just don't get it. But yeah. they think they're going to beat me. Yeah. And I, I just think that too, like if, if they want to, I guess, talk, it's like, it doesn't really matter because it's like, dude, you're going to get the same me regardless. So it's, it doesn't motivate me anymore or make me any more emotional about it. I, I don't know. You, you brought it up earlier. You try to get angry before fights and, uh, which was the biggest mistake I've right. ever made. Yeah. And so I feel like, I feel like there's no point in that. So this person literally has like no relevance or, um, nothing in my life. Like if I had a close friend that was talking crap, I'd be like, dude, like, we have a problem like that upsets me, but this guy's just a random dude. So you're getting it regardless. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's actually really smart. As you say, it's like this guy's nothing in your personal life. So why should that trigger your emotions? Yeah. 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 No, very smart. Very smart. Um, 
So you're doing this for fun. You're doing this because you're a natural fighter. But are you a fan? Would you say you're a fan of mixed martial arts and the UFC? I would definitely say I'm a fan. I, I love the sport. You know, I've been watching um, MMA and the UFC for a long time, you know, a long, long time. And uh, it's something that I really appreciate the growth of the sport, the way it's changed and how it's become mainstream. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of fighters and guys that I watch who I respect their skills. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting time to be part of the sport. And mm. I feel like, you know, it's exciting for me, the opportunity to, to hopefully continue to move that forward and, and push it forward into um, maybe, you know, bringing more viewers in or into a new level of competitiveness or, or whatever it is. There's a lot of different ways that I think the sport can be pushed forward. But, uh, you know, I, I think that hopefully I can be a part of that. So when you're there at the T-Mobile Arena, it's UFC 300. You're going to have some special signature fight gear. You know what I mean? There's going to be a lot of fanfare, pomp and circumstance and all the rest of it. And I'm bloody jealous because it <laughs> takes me back to when I fought in UFC 100. Uh, but when you look at the fight card as a fan, which is the one that you're really most looking forward to? Oh, man, there's so many good ones. Oof, that's a good question. I think that as a fan, the fight I'm looking forward to the most, I'll, 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 I'll name two. I think that Charles uh, Oliveira and Armin Sarkirian, that's a freaking yeah, amazing yeah. fight. Two guys that are so... High level, well rounded. Definitely, like I just mentioned, like kind of pushing that envelope and moving the sport forward. I think both these guys are doing that. And while they are both so skilled, I think they're both skilled in different areas. Obviously, you look at Oliveira, his ground game, and you know, fighting off his back, submissions, elbows, you know, big power on the feet. And then you look at Sarkirian, you know, showed big power from his last fight with Benil Dariush, but also, you know, just a really, really tough. Um, guy on the ground more of a top guy has a take down, took down islam makachev had a really close fight with uh you know islam so i mean that fight as far as skills go i mean that's definitely to me the probably one of the highest level fights on yeah. the card no no 100 percent agree so we're gonna let you go in a minute but i gotta ask you this so you came on here you said you gave yourself a three-year journey to become the champion so now we're about a year into that so now it's a two-year journey Everything's going to plan. You're still undefeated. You're on the biggest fight card to happen this year. The champion is Sh uh, Drickus Duplessis. I almost said Sean Strickland. What am I saying? <laughs> the champion is Drickus Duplessis. Number one, what did you think about that fight with Sean and Drickus? You know, I thought it was a good fight. I think uh, from my kind of outside view, it looked like Sean didn't really compete as well as he normally does. Um, I think he's the underdog in a lot of his fights. And it's a different type of pressure and scenario when you're the the champ and when you're the guy that people are coming from or they're that yep. people are coming after and so i don't feel like he put his best performance together i think drick is looks super motivated and he competed very well um but both guys to me are very beatable and uh both guys you know they the, the, they do things well and they do things you no know, not as well i think for me um if i can continue to improve get better um, with my striking and just grappling overall, obviously my wrestling is a complete X factor. So I feel like uh, both those guys have skills, but have holes. Mm. That's kind of the way I saw it. Okay. So right now the champ is Drickus and the top five is Drickus, Sean, Izzy, Whitaker, Jared Cannonier. Um, let's say two years, let's say four fights for yourself until you get a shot at the belt. Who do you think? at that time, will be the champion of the world. Have you envisaged that title fight and who do you think it's going to be against? Um, I, I guess I'll say this first. I, I really don't care. It doesn't really matter because, like I said, it's not personal to me at all. Like, none of these guys really, you know, it, it, I don't really want to beat any of those guys more than the next. You know, whoever has the belt is the guy I'll, I'll take out. But if, if I were to kind of have to, as a fan, again, predict who the champion would be, um, I kind of see the way this is going, uh, this division. I feel like um, a guy that you didn't mention who could be up there is Hamzat. And, uh, yes. you know, it, a bad matchup for really all those guys. Um, he would be, he would be a, a tough fight and a bad matchup for all those guys. And so I could see, you know, him, depending on what he wants to do, if he wants to get back down to 170 or if he wants to just continue to fight at 85, I could see him, um, like I said, because he's a little bit ahead of me. He's, he's in the rankings now and stuff. He'll probably fight for, 
the belt within one or two fights. Like it could be his next one. It could be one more, but uh, I, I see him probably being the champ and that's a dude that I would love to fight. You know, I, mm-hmm. I know I said that it's never personal for me, but he's a guy that I feel like just has this crazy reputation who I absolutely have to take out uh, before my career is over. So ideally we're both undefeated. It's for the belt. We do it in Allegiant stadium, um, the Raiders stadium and in front of a hundred thousand people. And then I just go do what I do. So that's to me like the goal. Again, if it's not him, it doesn't really matter, but that would be ideal. Yeah. And, and I'm smiling because I mean, that's, it, it makes all the sense in the world and you're absolutely right. Stylistically, I think he does have the ability. Of course you do as well. So that'd be great. Uh, so let me see right here. You're American. If you become the champion, it'll be another American champ. The other American champ that they had in the middleweight division was Sean Strickland. You could not be any different from Sean Strickland if you paid the price. Yeah, sorry, if you paid to be, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's your thoughts on America's champion? You know, um, I think that uh, for me, I don't really pay attention to all the stuff outside. I saw he had a few interesting quotes in the media and stuff like that uh, (laughs) before his last fight. And uh, honestly, for the most part, without saying it the way he said it, I agreed with a lot of what he said. (laughs) I think that, you know. (laughs) Careful. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I wouldn't wouldn't put it the way he put it. But, uh, you know, I think that... um, He's probably he's playing up he's playing it up a little bit you know he's he's yeah. doing his thing for me I'm always just going to continue to be myself be uh be organic and natural yeah. you know I'm not going to ever play a character and I feel like what's been really for- nice for me and fortunate for me is I haven't had to do that and I've also had a big push and a lot of people that want to watch me and support me and stuff like that probably because I had such a strong wrestling career and you know now just that um, momentum coming from that but uh, yeah you know I think that. I'm never going to really like be judgmental towards a person because everybody's got to make their own choices and and be their own person. But for me, again, I I just want to be authentic, be myself. And like I said, I think that I'm in a, I'm in a great position because people actually enjoy that. They want to listen to me. They want to watch me fight. So I know it's kind of a, a luxury that I'm grateful for. Words of wisdom, words of wisdom, profound, eloquent, articulate, a monster inside the octagon. Bo, we wish you all the success. Good luck at UFC 300. Thanks again for your time today. Really appreciate it. And yeah, have a great fight. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Take care, Bo. All the best, buddy. Yep. All right, Herringbone, get on here. What's going on? There he is. I mean, as I said, profound, eloquent, well-spoken, calm demeanor. I mean, non-judgmental. He had nothing bad to say. Even Hamza is like, yeah, it just excites me to be able to take the zero. I mean... Oozing confidence. That's why I was like, it was uh, God, you know, I just, I just, I just dream about the day someone can take me to round two. <laughs> but as I, I say, the reason, sorry, the reason I was kind of grinning is not because, because he knows what he's capable of and his wrestling has shown that. And if you look at another comparable, if you will, would be a Hamza. You know what I mean? When you have that wrestling base, when you're as, le- as athletic as he is, you know, I that, that he's saying this because he's just simply aware of what he can do to another human being. So that's why he's not uh, delusional. Anyway, I will allow you to speak. Dude, I was cracking up in the background because I've been waiting for a UFC fighter to say that for 15 years now. Like, why are these guys signing the contract to fight me? They yeah. know this is going to end poorly. This is a bad business decision <laughs> by you to agree to fight me. Oh, Why man. would you choose to fight me? <laughs> You're not even going to get to the second round. I'm not going to get out of second gear. Do you know what I mean? I'm not even going to train for you. It's like, you're out of your mind. No, God bless him. I'm looking forward to it. And that was a great answer as well. He said, listen, wh- wh- why are you giving me shit? Why are you complaining about me? You know, I he didn't allocate the position. Um, anyway, best of luck to Bo Nickel. All right, today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp that are really offering an incredible service. Mental health is something that is spoken about regularly but still has a stigma attached to it. We even saw Sean Strickland just recently opening up about it, you know, talking about how he still struggles. He's rich, he's famous, and he still struggles. Lots of people talk about it, but you might be sitting there thinking that this applies to you, but a lot of people still struggle to take the... uh, the bull by the horns, okay? Well, BetterHelp are going to make it extremely easy 
and convenient for you. All you got to do is sign up to betterhelp.com and you'll be matched up with a licensed professional therapist in no time at all. You don't have to drive to the other side of town. You can do it all conveniently at home. You can do it from your phone. You have video sessions. If you're not gelling or vibing with the person, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional cost. Okay. So whatever your issue is, it could be a whole multitude of things. Maybe you've got anxiety. Maybe you're overeating. Maybe you've got a substance abuse issue. You're drinking too much. You're arguing. You've got crazy temper problems, whatever it is, become the best version of yourself. And Respect yourself and respect your loved ones because your loved ones want you to take charge of your mental health as well. They want you to address address your issues because your issues are becoming their issues. So do yourself a favor and do your loved ones a favor as well. Become your own soulmate, whether you are looking for one or not. Visit betterhelp.com slash believe to get 10% off your first month. You will thank me for this later. Betterhelp.com slash believe. All right, so as we know, Bo Nickel, he will be opening the main card and the top of the main card will be the former champ, Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill has been taken to Twitter, Harrington, and he, uh, he does not buy the hype over Alex Pereira. Correct? Uh, no, he, in fact, he said, Bruno Silva beat Alex convince me. Otherwise also show me one round of him just straight up outclassing somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And then he had some other tweets as well. I think as well, he was on a bit of a tweeting marathon this morning or last night, whenever it was, you know, Somebody mentioned Alex Pereira and Sean Strickland, right? You know, and then someone said, well, no, catching somebody with a left hook isn't outclassing them, which is kind of, I understand, I understand that, but he was, he set that up. It wasn't like a fluke shot. He didn't just close his eyes and swing. Uh, Jamal Hill, Alex Pereira, what do you think? Do you think Jamal is underestimating Alex Pereira? I think there's a potential for that. Right. And I think as fighters, we've got to do that. We want to, we've got to strip somebody down. You can't look at them. You can't put them on this pedestal as this unbelievable guy. The reality is, though, Pereira, this will be the fifth champion that he's fought against, four that he's beaten, and the fifth that he could potentially be in just eight fights and a champion of two divisions. That's not a coincidence. You don't go out there and beat four champions in seven fights unless you are something special. Yeah, but I mean, I, look, there's absolutely no disagreement here, right? The 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 way that he beat Israel Adesanya coming back in, in the fifth round, they're still having that power at the ready, you know, 22, 23 minutes into a title fight when nobody had ever seen him leave the third round is absolutely incredible. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not taking anything away from him. I don't think Jamal is either. But I also like I think in Jamal's mind, this guy is a huge hitter for 185. He's got good pop at 205. I've fought guys with good pop at 205. This guy doesn't bring a wrestling game I'm afraid of. He doesn't bring a a jujitsu game that I'm afraid of, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, for where Jamal's coming from, it's two guys who are just going to stand and bang. He's never lost that fight in his life. Mm, Yeah, no, it's interesting. And and you make some valid points, to be fair. Um, And I think even Yuri Prohaska said, Yuri was doing pretty good. I think Yuri said this week or in an interview recently, he feels he was winning that fight against Jamal until those elbows came. And, you know, that's open for discussion. I think Yuri fundamentally could do with improving some things because he's got that wild style which makes him effective, but it's a little traditional martial art. And I'm not trying to talk shit about Yuri. I'm a big, big fan of that guy. When you look at Jamal Hill, though, and here's a criticism that people say, not me. People say, well, Jamal Hill, you beat an old version of Glover Teixeira, who was 42 years old. What was he, 42 or 40, something like that? I'll double check, but I believe it was you don't, 42. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, you know, he was the champion of the world. It's not his fault that he was the champion. So you can't criticize him for beating the champ. Before that, he beat Thiago Santos, knocked him out cold. Before that, Johnny Walker. I mean, Johnny Walker is a big dude. Johnny Walker's in his prime. Johnny Walker hits hard. He's a freak of nature. And that was one of the sickest knockouts ever. So, and before that, Jimmy Crute, again, knockout. So three, three knockouts, one decision over the champ. Um, what are your thoughts on that fight? Be honest, Harrington. I don't know. I, I, I have seen, I've seen Alex Pereira slumped over, you know, asleep in the cage, getting knocked out. I've never seen that with Jamal Hill. So, I mean, if it's like I said, if it's two guys are going to stand and swing absolute hammers at each other. Yeah. Pereira might be, you know, more technically sound coming from a kickboxing background, whatever the case may be. But 
Jamal Hill has a chin and the power to put him out for certain. Yep. Uh, and I'm just, his chin's never been cracked. And, and you raise a good point. Jamal definitely has the power. I think he does have the ability to take his good shots because, as you say, I mean, Israel Adesanya was able to knock him out. Granted, at 185, you can't take a shot as well there. Uh, is Jamal as polished? Probably not. Is he big, powerful, explosive? Was he, he could have been a pro basketballer, right, if I'm not mistaken. He had a scholarship playing basketball. That's how he tore his Achilles. So he's very, very athletic. And maybe he might not be quite as polished technically, but that doesn't mean you're not as effective. And with four rounds gloves on, you've only, you've only got to connect once. And Jamal Hill does have that kind of power. Early prediction from yourself, Pereira or Jamal Hill? And I'll throw it to you, Brian, as well. My early prediction, it does not make it out of round two. How about that? It's going to be a quick fight. It's going to be a banger, <laughs> oh, though. I mean, right. But listen, I, I was going to say that I'm kind of leaning to Jamal, right? Yeah. But as I said, Jamal, a two-weight division champion at glory. Beaten four former champs, Sean Strickland, Israel Adesanya, Yuri Prohaska, who's the other one? Jan. Jan Blahovic. So he's beaten four former champions, right? You know, and he was a glory champ. He's been the champion at two weight classes. That's a hell of an accomplishment <laughs> list in, in seven fights. Do you still think Jamal Hill is the winner? It's so tough to pick against that pre pedigree, yeah. right? But at the same time, you know, like, it, it, I don't know what Jamal Hill's resume is, but he can only beat the guys who've been put in front of him. And the only guy who's put up any kind of a, a test to him so far in the octagon is Paul Craig, who broke his arm on a submission, right? I, yeah. Alex Prayer is not breaking out any flying arm bars here. <laughs> no, he's definitely not. Neither is Jamal Hill. And they both said they're not going to wrestle. Do you know what I mean? So we'll see what happens, you know, but we might get a Nate Diaz special. Brian, Brian, jump back on, brother. Uh, yes. You're going to get to choose. Now, we're not going to do anything political because a lot of people are going, they're going batshit crazy in the comments. And I don't want to get political anyway. But in the non MMA section, Brian, <laughs> a couple of one, one of them is for sure political. <laughs> we have a Venezuelan uh, vixen, I was going to say, a Venezuelan migrant blown up on TikTok telling people how to uh, enforce squatters' rights. We have Gordon Ryan clapping back at Fionn Davis about the, the, the fight to pay between the disparity between male and female. These are both political. Those are two that we're not going to touch. <laughs> and what, about, we, what about number three? We got the Neuralink. Okay. Neuralink is going. All right, let's talk about that, Brian. Give me your thoughts on that. For those people that don't know what Neuralink is, it's a chip, <laughs> and I am butchering this, that Elon Musk has developed. You implant it into somebody's brain. And with that, I got a video. They have the power. They have the power to do a lot of stuff just by thinking about it. And please, all right, let's have a look. This video here, I saw it on Twitter earlier. I saw it on the news as all well. All right, we should be streaming live here. Hello, world. How's it going out there? My name is uh, Bliss, and I'm an engineer at Neuralink. Not and, bothered. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the first ever user of the Neuralink device. And I think you're my only telekinetic friend that I have. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, not many more of those out there. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Noel. Can we Arbaugh? skip forward a bit, right? To the good stuff. No offense to these guys. Yeah, yeah. There, was, there it is. It's a, it's a long old video. What was it about Neuralink that made that possible for you? Yeah, so one of the big things the, was. There, there oh, we I, go. Think I just got checkmated. Um, um, the only way I could play it. All right, all right, all right. Through, Kill the video. Uh, Kill the video. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that was like, you know, like you watch a YouTube video and they do the big introduction at the start. <laughs> you know, it's like no one cares. Just get to the good stuff. Hi, everyone. Fan, thanks for watching the channel. And uh, if you don't mind subscribing, and today we're going to say, shut the fuck up. Just Give throw the, the watermelon stuff. off the dam. That's what we're here Listen, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy's playing chess. Okay. So I said to my wife this morning, I said, oh, shit, look at this. And she goes, what is it? She was in the bathroom. I said, uh, it's a, a, a guy's got the neural link in it, in his head. He, and, he's, and she said, what's he doing? I said, he's playing computer games with his mind. And then I said, all right, granted, it's not exactly Call of Duty. He's moving a mouse cursor with his mind. But even still, that's pretty incredible. Well, there's videos of like paraplegics playing Call of Duty with their faces, like just using a tongue controller. It's pretty wild. And they're like smoking people too. It's crazy. But uh. I mean, this is this is fine. This is a great step, but let me know when they start swinging hammers with that. You know what I mean? Fucking, what do you mean swinging hammers? You know, 
get these paraplegics on construction sites. Get a, you know, get a hammer drill in their hands, whatever, or in their robot Jesus, hands. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, no, it's unreal because they say, and I don't understand the link between this one, or maybe you guys do, and I, you probably don't because you're not neurologists. You're not neuroscientists. You're not Elon Musk. But I don't even this, feign yeah, interest in that stuff. This, this opens the door to them being able to fix, cure blindness, uh, paralysis, people that have never been able to walk, you know, things like that. I don't understand how the link in there will fix those things. It's just like electrical signals. So, like, your brain is probably still making the signals. Like, it's like people's phantom pains and shit. Like, your brain's still making the signal to move that thing. It's just that those muscles don't exist or, like, yeah, the pathway yeah. doesn't exist. So they no. just repair the pathway. Yeah, no, for sure. I understand that. But, but my point is, like, for example, I have one eye. Right? Oh yeah, uh, and the reason that I can't see out of my right eye is because when I, it wasn't the detached retina, it was when I got glaucoma. So the pressure in the eye got really high, which killed the nerve endings at the back of the eyeball. So the they nerve made, endings are dead. They made the robot eye. Yeah, but but just because you stick a link in the in the brain, yeah, the neural link, how is that then gonna? Well, your brain sees right. Your it's like your brain is what makes the 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 images so yeah but the nerves send the images to the brain so if they could make a robot like a like an electronic link like a fake eyeball like a camera and then link that into the, I, i'm not a neuroscientist but i would I know, imagine I know, I know. that if they could link that to your brain it would be a similar outcome you're doing a good job though, of, of of dissecting the code. Speaking of eyeballs, I went in the other day because I was getting a new one. I was getting a refresher. I've got a little video. I'm gonna I'll send it in at some point. Where the way they do it, it's wild. So they're putting all the the um, you know the solution what they do to mold a new one, and then they have like a straw sticking out of it that they they pour the solution down right into your bare eyeball. It's kind of cold and stings and stuff. But uh, well done to Elon Musk, man. He truly is changing the world, changing the goddamn world. It's unbelievable. Well, Dude, you know, motivated people my, with money. My yeah. first thought when I saw this, I just saw the mouse moving and I was like, this is so lame. Who is going to get a thing put into their head just so they don't have to touch their keyboard? Yeah. And then I saw he was paralyzed and I was like, oh, no, this is actually a great thing. Like, this is my cynical. Like, I, I, I can't contain it. But like, yeah, if that's who you're using this on to give them a, a wider range of the world. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. No, for sure. For sure. That's incredible in itself. But you got to think of it like this. So when you see that he's just controlling a cursor, he's playing a rudimentary game of chess on a computer. It's like going back to like the 80s and you used to have Pong. Remember, you put the mm -hmm. cartridges in and you played on your TV and there were those crappy uh, computer games. Now look at it. Now look what's been achievable in what what 30, 30 years 40 years 40 some, years for, for, 40 years yeah for some reason i think of the 80s as like 10 15 years ago mm -hmm. 20 years it's always 20 years ago the 80s is it's 20 years ago 40 years ago 1984 <laughs> was 40 years ago that's wild man wild yeah you know did you have one of those you, you were too young you two weren't you i was but i was born with a nintendo like my older brother had one in 1986 when they came out and I was, I born in 87. So I've always had a Nintendo. What year were you born, Harrington? I was born in 88, but yeah, I mean, NES all the way. I mean, there were some, there were some older people I knew who had Ataris back in the day. So I did get to play the Pong on the regular, like the, the, the switch controller. I remember uh, going around to somebody's house as a kid and they had a Sega Master System. Did you get those in America? And the game that was built in was Alex the Kid. Sega oh. Master? No, we had a Sega Genesis was our... our yeah. That so was Genesis, like... Genesis, that, yeah. that was like... We called that in the UK a Mega Drive, the Sega, which I think is a uh, way better name. Sega Mega Drive, that was the 16-bit. But the 8-bit was the Master System. So what was the Sega 8-bit called in America? I, those never got super popular. We had a Super Nintendo was our 16-bit, yeah. if I'm not yeah. mistaken. It's right. Snazzed. So yeah. I think Sega Sega blew up in the like in Japan, like the 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 Master System. And I remember it was called the Master System because there was a Western executive trying to pitch it to a Japanese guy, and he's like, "The Master, like you know, like you know how important a Master System is. This is going to be the greatest thing ever." And it got them to sign on. It's a good name, isn't it? The Master System. That is good. <laughs> That's what I might call it. Michael Bisping's Master System of Martial Arts. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I I, 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 I don't know how we've gone from Neuralink to talking about consoles. 
You know what I mean? Because they were playing games. Yeah, playing games, exactly. And I don't know shit about neurology, so we'll talk about Sega Master Systems (laughs) and Nintendos and Mario, okay? Um, Yeah, Super Nintendos, man. I was obsessed with Nintendos when I was a kid. Street Fighter 2, I say it all the time. I will whoop all of you. I'm the only person I know to beat Battletoads. Ooh, which one? The original Battletoads. I don't know it. Oh, it's super difficult, even as an adult. Like, I went back when I was like, I don't know, a few years ago, maybe like 10 years ago now, I went back and I just played all the games that I couldn't beat when I was a toddler. And I was like, oh, most of these are easy. Ninja Turtles and Battletoads are the two hardest games that I've ever beaten. And I had to wait like 20 years before I could do it. So we went for a walk on Sunday, me, Rebecca, and Lucas. We've been doing a lot of walking recently. We've been obsessed with steps. And in fact, did you see McGregor in that interview? He was talking about this. He said, you've got to get 10,000 steps a day. Oh, did he? If you do, yeah, yeah, he was doing some interview with Jake Gyllenhaal and a couple of the other cast of Roadhouse. I think the physicality for me, I don't know <laughs> yeah. what I'm doing. I don't even know how to walk half the time. So, um, <laughs> doing Make sure a, you get your steps in. Yeah, yeah. 10,000 steps a day. 10,000 a day. 10,000 a day. No, I... Like 30 marathons a year then. You've completed. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's what they t- say. 10,000 steps a day is, t- is 30 marathons a year completed. Here we go. And, uh, because Rebecca's obsessed with walking. So every day we go for a long walk. We're lucky we've got some trails by our house. But McGregor said on this thing, he said, you got to get your 10,000 steps a day. If you get your 10,000 steps a day, that's equivalent to something like 100 marathons per year. And I thought, what What are you smoking, bro? But then I thought about it, 10,000 mm-hmm. steps, which isn't that hard to achieve, by the way. We're obsessed with it on the health app on your phone, right? 10,000 steps is three miles. You do that 10 times, you've walked 30 miles. So you do that. According 365 to, times. According to Google, the average yep. for 10,000 steps is five miles. Five miles. So do this. Five miles times 365. If you do 10,000 steps, I'll do it right now. Right? Hold on. 1,825. Five. five 1,780, I got. Oh, okay. Five times Three, six, five. One, eight, two, five. 1,825. Yeah, I might have put three, five, six. Now, let's divide that by 26. 70.1. So if you walk 10,000 steps a day, which doesn't take long, we, we go out down this trail, it's about an hour, you're running 70 marathons a year. Man. That's pretty impressive. I mean, they, they've been saying it forever, right? I, how many times do I have to hear, get your 10,000 steps? My, my, my wife jokingly says it, but it's like, yeah, it is nice. And if you have All a right. kid, yeah, but, it, but isn't it huh? qual- quality over quantity, right? Like, you're not getting your heart rate up if you're walking like an old man 10,000 steps no, a day. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. I, and I watched a YouTube video recently because some people are supplementing steps for exercise. And it's not. If you live a sedentary lifestyle, no offense, like you, Brian, you're sitting there at a computer all day. And I do as well. That's why I've been enough. trying to get I've been trying to get more steps in because you know I work from home, I'll do a YouTube, I'll do a podcast, all that type of stuff. I'm not out on a building site. Do you know what I mean? So I work out in the morning. Other than that, I'm sitting on my backside. So I was I was very conscious of it. You know, so if you're working out, that's great. And if you want to walk, fantastic. But the walk and getting the steps doesn't replace exercise. You've got to lift weights. You've got to put the body through stress to get the benefits of it. You've got to build muscles. You've got to build your cardiovascular system. You've got to release the endorphins. Walking baby steps won't do that, but never mind that. Show me your steps. Steps challenge right now. So far today, I am on 7,837. You can't see that, but it's true. I, I could probably estimate my steps at about 250 like i i walked downstairs i made breakfast i walked to my car i drove to the store i drove back i got back out of my car and i walked back and i sat down in the seat that's seven steps now granted to be fair i did a three and a half mile run this morning so my steps are a little skewed uh harrington what are your steps unmute unmute yeah i know sorry i I kept missing the button baby um Okay, so I'm shocked at how much it was. And then I remember I walked out to the car to try to get the stroller. I'm at 37.52 for the day. But yeah, okay. How far away is your fine. car? Not far. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, in the words of Conor McGregor, get your steps in. If you do 10,000 a day, 
you're running 70 marathons a year. To be fair, that's seven days a week. All right, this episode is sponsored by Prize Picks, and Prize Picks is the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. And they are the easiest and the most exciting way to play DFS daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers, so it really couldn't be any easier. Will it be more or less than a given time frame, period, points, strikes, takedown, goals, hoops, points, whatever you want to call it? More or less, it is that simple. You can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. It's that easy to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of plays and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. And by the way, Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday, every single Tuesday. Prize Picks also offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account. So, what more do you want to know? Well, you want to know what's going on. For example, this weekend, Jalen Brunson, will he get more or less than 28.5 points? We're talking about basketball, in case you didn't know. Jamal Murray, will he get more or less than 7.5 assists? And lastly, Nikola Jokic, will he get more or less than 12 and a half rebounds? If you know the answers to that, and to be honest, it's a 50-50, so it's really not that hard. Head on over to prizepicks.com slash believe. Use the code believe for a deposit, a first deposit match of up to $100. prizepicks.com slash believe. The code is believe for a first deposit match of up to $100. Anyway, should we uh, talk about something? How long until Sean O'Malley joins us? We've got eight minutes. So Harrington, throw me a mixed martial arts story. Make it a good one, please. Okay. Uh, so I thought this was super interesting and I've never, I have seen it done once before in my life. Uh, but Alex Pereira is talking right now uh, about the prospect of turning around if he has a good UFC 300 and fighting at UFC 301, he already has a prospective opponent in mind uh, because people were asking his manager, you know, your next opponent might have a, a heavy grappling style. Would that affect, you know, how you're training? He said, no, I've been doing a ton of grappling training as is right now. Uh, the idea would be he'd be fighting uh, uh, Jamal Hill and then Magomed Ankalaev have 21 days apart. Yeah. Oh, what's going on? Sorry. I meant to hit. Oh, there you are. Um, yeah, I, I did see that, and I saw reports somewhere. Apparently, he's got a clause in the contract. Right? I don't know where that came from. I remember uh, reading it at the time, but I forget about it. I, I forgot. Who was it? Uh, I believe it was Luke Thomas reported that uh, on his new show, and then uh, uh, Pereira did uh, confirm that. Okay. Oh, really? So he does have a clause in the contract that if he gets through it unscathed, he will be main eventing four or five weeks later. Three weeks later, it's 21 days Three. from event to event. I mean, that's some guy, isn't it? You know what I mean? That's <laughs> unreal. Never mind. Never mind five champions in eight <laughs> fights. He's back. He's headlining pay-per-views all over the goddamn place. I mean, <laughs> that's a legendary guy, right? Fair play. Listen, Jamal's amazing. He isn't doing this. <laughs> um, right. I understand him wanting to do that. It's Brazil. He wants to go back. He wants to headline a pay per view in his home country. That's one of the that's one of the best feelings as a champion. You know what I mean? When you can take the belt home, defend it in front of your people, it's an incredible feeling. I was lucky enough to do that, and I'll never forget it. Um, but they always say in sports or combat sports, you can't look past your opponent. You know, and I I still feel like it's a possibility to do this without necessarily disrespecting or not respecting the threat of a Jamal Hill. He's just confident that, you know, history has shown he can take people out of there. And if he was to do it, then, yeah, fair play to him. I mean, it's legendary stuff. My only question is, who would it be? And you already answered that. So you're saying it would be Magomed Ankalaev because I'm looking at the rankings. I mean, who else would it be? Jamal, he's fighting. Prahaska, he's beat. Ankalaev would be the one. Then it's Rakic, Jan Blahovic, Krilov. Yeah, Magomed Ankalaev. The only problem is... It's a risky, that is a risky one because Jamal, there couldn't be a bigger difference between Jamal Hill and Magomed Ankalaev. Magomed Ankalaev, I believe, if Pereira gets through Jamal, and that's a big if, but if he gets through Hill, his biggest threat is by far Magomed Ankalaev. Everybody in that list, 
Yuri, kind of a striker first. Uh, who else we got? Rakic, kind of a striker first. Krilov, he, all right, he's well rounded. Walker, he's a striker. Magomed Ankalaev is a very, very serious threat in every department of mixed martial arts. Are they just going to tack this fight on to the card if that's the case? Because wouldn't this be like unfair to Magomed? Is he going to get a different opponent if Jamal Hill gets beat up during uh, 300? Like, it just seems like there's weird logistics going on. That's if... an interesting question. And it's a very, very good point. Does Ankalaev get another opponent? I don't, I, I, I don't know. Maybe they've, maybe they've spoken to Magomed about that. As you said, look, this, this is the situation. Bear this in mind. Have this date in mind, but it's not guaranteed. If he gets through him, would you want to fight him? And if he says yes, he says yes. If he says no, I'm not willing to do that. But you know what these crazy Dagestanis are like? Do you know what I mean? They're training 24-7. Do you know what I mean? They're not yeah. out there partying. They don't need to get the alcohol out of the system. They're not need laying off the weed. They're like, what time is wrestling? What I time just, is fighting? You don't think, it, I think it would just be like a little unfair if they were like, okay, Magomed, you're either going to fight Alex Pereira or you're going to fight like a completely different fighter with a completely different style and... Yeah, yeah, but but if Magomed's happy to accept, obviously they've had a discussion with him. You know what I'm sure, saying? Fair and, enough. and I think I think Magomed Ankalaev have certainly given that last win over Johnny Walker and how he's taken out pretty much everybody. Who was the, is it Paul Craig, the only person to beat him? Uh yeah, I believe he's still the only person to beat him. Uh there was uh yeah, the no and the only person to Walker beat Jamal and... Hill. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Paul Craig. Uh, yeah, look, listen, if he's happy to do it, if he's happy for those circumstances, then fair play. Alex Pereira will do it for sure. And I've kind of got a feeling that that was probably what went down. They said, look, listen, Magomed, here's what we're thinking. How do you feel about it, brother, send location? And he's there. Yeah. He's, and I'm he's sure it's a thing where it's like, he, I doubt he would be on that card if not for a title opportunity. You know what I mean? So I don't think like yeah. there's concern where it's like, uh, you actually might have to fight, uh, you know, Nikita Krylov on this card. Sorry. Like, that's, I don't think they're going to hit him with that. Have him train during Ramadan for the chance at a title. It's like, you know, you're, you're getting yeah, I'm just looking at resting. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at this in the notes. Drikis Duplessis reiterated his desire to settle the score with Israel Adesanya. He acknowledges that Strickland, the Strickland fight is there and he's open to it, but he says that he wants to fight someone the fans want to see him fight more than anything. Elaborate. Uh, so he said, you know, he he does understand Sean Strickland's out there. He's talking about wanting this immediate rematch, but uh, he he's sta- <laughs> all right. Uh, sorry, we have a, uh, a guest popping up. We'll get to that. In a oh, second. get out of here, Hamilton. Nobody wants to speak to you anyway. I am. I regret the moment I have to see your face. Sean O'Malley. In fact, no, let me redo that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by the one and only bantamweight champion of the world. Sean, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Brother Bisbing, how's it going? Not too bad. Just enjoying this beautiful weather before it gets too hot. How you doing, yeah. brother? I'm good, man. I'm good. I see you sitting in that big throne that you've got there. I saw that on a YouTube video recently. Uh, it's quite that's quite the throne for a king. Yeah, I know. I just you know, they get you on the internet sometimes. I don't even know what I was looking up, but I seen this and I was like, I I have to have you got, it. You gotta, gotta have it. it. How much does yeah. one pay for something like that? Um you know what? I don't even look at this point, Bisbee. I don't even know <laughs> at this point. Hey, it's like, whatever. Give me two. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's quite the shot of your balls that we'd have as well if you moved your hands. They, they are very strategically placed. <laughs> you know what? Sorry about that, brother. <laughs> oh, no, you're good, uh, buddy. You're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, listen, Sean, thanks for your time today, buddy. Uh, Got to start with this. As you know, I'm boys with Cheeto, but I've got a 100% respect what I saw there. That, that that really was something special. It was a phenomenal performance. Cheeto's a tough bastard, and you made him prove how tough he was. It was, from start to finish, sublime, beautiful, technically proficient. I mean, it was perfect. It was it was one of the best performances I've seen. I appreciate that, Bisbee. I've known you've always been Cheeto's boy, and you've always kept it unbiased. As, uh, you know, I've always appreciated that. So, yeah, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, performance overall i felt like it was yeah it was beautiful didn't quite get the finish but it is what it is it's the next best thing that could have happened without getting a finish is whooping ass for five rounds yeah yeah look listen i mean we all want to get a finish but also 
you were able to go out there and show the world what you're capable of. I mean, that, as I say, I've said it multiple times, that was some of the best boxing, the best display of balance and accuracy. Because a lot of people, I get frustrated sometimes. You see people running in with the punches and being reckless and they fall into the clinch. It's like mm -hmm. being in control of yourself, being in control of your weapons, your balance, your precision, your shot selection, everything. It was it was something special, man. The, the work you've done is really showing. Yeah, the greasy hair really helped me just stay balanced <laughs> and uh, really helped me to, uh, pinpoint my shot. The greasy hair, man. Why would you do that, Sean? Just in case. You never know. No, yeah, that was a weird one. I, I feel like, I mean, even in the pictures or the video you watch, I, mean, I feel like you can see if someone's hair is greasy. It's pretty visual. Uh, you know, my hair was as beautiful as ever, and uh, I thought that was a weird one. I feel bad for the guy. I'm like, just, just, just say I got my ass kicked. You'll get more fans. He's losing fans per minute. Uh, you're putting me in a tricky spot here. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked for this interview. Cheat I'm going to get a phone call from Cheetah going, what the f*** is, Ben? I thought we were friends. He's like, bro, this is what I do. This is no, how no. I make a living. I, I brought it up. That's on me. No, we no, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm literally joking. I don't care. I'll slap him. Um, <laughs> so, so I mean, where did we start? I mean, you and Cheeto, you, you've shared the ring for five rounds, and it was the second fight. I see you got the, the the poster in the background. Will you guys ever be good? Will you ever bury the hatchet? Um, I feel like in my position, the one that's you know the alpha, the king. It's 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 easier for me to say, yeah, you know what, I don't mind the dude. But for him, I don't know. If he says it's not personal. He says I'm just another guy. But I, I mean, he's probably has nightmares of the, of me at night. He probably wakes up in sweat thinking about me punching him. So I, I don't know. If that's on him, I don't really, you know, I'm not running low on friends, so I don't really, you know, need another guy, buddy. Yeah. Um, but you never know. We'll we'll see how it, how it plays out. Not running low on friends, I think, is an underestimate, uh, understatement. You know, I mean, yeah. the champion of the world, you're everyone's favorite fighter these days. You're topping the Billy Miami. You know, you're flying around the world in private jets. I mean, life, life is pretty good now, Sean. Right. Yeah, I mean, life has been good for a long time. Even, you know, before I was champ, I was living like the champ. You know, I think it's just a mindset. It's, uh, you know, I was able to do that financially too, which I was, I'm in a, you know, in a unique position. I feel like I've been making championship money for the last few years, but now that I'm actually making the pay-per-view money, woo-wee! Yeah, and you deserve it, man. You really do. Talk to me about this, though, like young Sean. I mean, obviously, you always had belief in yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and a popular term that people use these days is I manifested it. But you always believe in yourself, and as fighters, you have to. But have you even surprised yourself at how successful you've been? I wouldn't say I, su I, wouldn't say I surprised myself in in that sense, how successful I've been. I have been. I think more so it's like surprising. I don't even know if surprising is the right word. It's more like just mind-blowing how just my career's played out. Even still watching back the Aljo fight, going in there with an injury. Aljo's the hardest guy in the division for me at the time. And uh, to go out there and put his lights out in two was, was just crazy. And then the Cheeto rematch, it's like that's the next – that was the biggest fight in the division because of how the first fight played out. So just how my career's played out, it's just crazy. But I definitely wouldn't say I'm surprised. Uh, I, I've still – I still have, you know, when I'm that young buck looking, looking into the future, you know, we're, I'm not even really close to where I'm going to be. Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be, and I've said it since before I even got to the, I'm going to be bigger than Connor. People think I, I, you know, that's a stab at Connor from me, but it's, you know, nothing. I'm probably the biggest Connor fan. It's just a good goal metric of, of where I want to be. And that's bigger than Connor. And that's, I'm not there yet. I'm, am I'm, I'm on my way, but I'm really not even that close yet. When you talk about how many pay-per-views he's done, top 10, he's like seven out of the top 10. Like, I'm not even close there. I'm closer than I was, you know, a year ago, two years ago, fucking last week, but I'm not yeah. really there yet. So I just use that bigger than Connor as a crazy metric um, of, of where I want to be. How, how old are you now, Sean? 29. 29. I mean, you got bags and bags and bags of time to go. Uh, we've got to talk about what's next, though. Marab Davalishvili, you know, he's, I'm sure you see Marab as some like little annoyance, just nipping at your heels and talking shit and stealing your jacket and all this type of stuff. Uh, I did like your tweet. Marab's next, 2025. 
And, and everyone was like, this is great. I'm like, guys, is nobody seeing that he said 2025 and we're in March? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, I Rob's easy to get angry. You know, he's just a <laughs> little, he's got short man syndrome, first of all. He's just ugly as could be. So he's like, that's got to oh, play God. a role in life. That would oh. suck. So I just, you know, just pecking at the little guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so who, who is it next, though? Is it going to be Marab? Is it Ender Magomedov? Is it... Yeah, it's, it's definitely leaning... Yeah, d- definitely leaning towards Marab. The, the Ilya fight, you know, that's a that's a potential big fight someday. If I go out there, win a few more, Ilya, you know, keeps doing what he's doing and, and wins a few more. You know, that could be a massive fight next end of next year, I would say, if, if we both go out there and do what we, what we need to do. It could be a massive fight someday, but, you know, I think it's yeah. leaning towards Marab next, which is, you know, a lot of people say I'm ducking him and I, I don't want that fight, but I don't mind that fight. I don't think, I don't look at that fight and go, oh God, that's, you know, I look at the Ilya fight and think, okay, fuck, this is kind of scary. Marab's scary in his own way. You know, he's got five rounds cardio. You can get, you know, it's guaranteed he's going to push the pace. He's guaranteed he's going to shoot. He's guaranteed he's going to, you know, bring it. But I knocked those kind of people out. I didn't knock Cheeto out. But I, you know, I, it's not like I got tired and I could, I would have, I could have kept going. I could have cheated up for another five rounds. Like that was, oh, oh. you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't the rest, you know, obviously it's different cardio, kickboxing. Your, your phone's on the oh, move. Shit. The, sorry, the sorry. phone's on the move. It's got a, oh, you, you got a ghost, bro. No, my little puppy hit, hit her, hit the table. But yeah, what, I, I what, mean, what, what a good challenge. A uh, sheep a doodle. Sheep a sheep a doodle. Yeah, sheep dog doodle. Oh, I okay, okay. I have a what is it? A Yorkie poo, a Yorkie poo, Yorkie poo. One of those little mutts, huh? Yeah, a little shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's all right. W- w- what's the multi poo called? Or oh, the sheepy poo? Whatever it's, whatever the hell it is. What's it a called? Sheep- what's her name? Yeah, Mary Jane. <laughs> of course it is. My guy's I got, Harry. I got, yeah, I got Kush and Mary Jane. They're they're my they're my little pups. But uh, nice. But yeah, fuck um, I'm gonna beat his ass. Basically, All right, okay, and I look forward to it. I look forward to it when the day comes. Give me your thoughts on Ilya Tapori. Do you see some kind of com- uh, some parallels between what you're doing right now because you've just become the champion, you're a huge star, Tapori on the flip side at 45, and I mean from a respect angle. I mean, he's making huge waves. He's ridiculously popular out there in Spain. I think I just saw that is him and his wife or him and his girlfriend, I'm not sure which he is, they're like, the face of Dolce and Gabbana, some new perfume or something. Really, some big, yeah, yeah. When, when are we going to see Sean O'Malley with some? Uh, I don't know your your own fragrance. Yeah, I got my own <laughs> fragrance right now. I just got done gaming for four hours. I got that Call of Duty stench. Um, there you go. But yeah, I think you know, I like what Aelia is doing for for me in my position. You know, a superstar. You want another star. You want another guy. You want a Connor. You need a Floyd. To have that Connor match, you need a Connor and a Habib. You need the two stars. I'm always looking for a star. Like I'm looking for that next guy. Marab definitely ain't a superstar, but I'll go whoop his ass and I'll make myself become more of a star. Ilya has to go out there, beat whoever's next, whether it's Max or Ortega or you know who who knows. Whoever he, you know, he goes out and does his thing. I'm gonna continue to do my thing, and uh, I look forward to you know a super fight. That's what I've been in this sport for since the beginning. You know, it was to want because I wanted to be in the biggest fights on the biggest stages. So I like when I see someone like Ilya become a superstar. Yeah, no, absolutely. Talk to me about Corey Sandagen. What's your feelings on this guy? Very dangerous, very skilled. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of his work, I'm a fan of his style. Uh, very dangerous guy. And he'll probably fight. I'm hearing him versus Umar is probably what's going to be next. So I, I would imagine. Uh, I go out there, beat Mrab, and I'll probably fight the winner of one of those two. That's that's what I would, if I had a guess and, and look into the future, that could be it. Yeah, does that kind of, I don't know, because I think you were talking about this recently, Umar Namagamadov, having the last name Namagamadov, right? Yeah. That would be a massive, massive fight, which of course you take a cut in being the champ. You know, w- 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 would it be somewhat bittersweet if Sandegan was to beat him and take that opportunity away? Um, you know, if he goes out there and beats him in spectacular fashion, which he very, very well could, you know, hopefully that he, he creates a, a star out of yeah. that, you know, hopefully he be, but I do think Umar's a b- bigger fight, which is weird just because he's, 
I don't even, I've never sat down and actually watched Umar fight. I've, you know, watched Corey fight a bunch, but Umar and Magomedov could be a, you know, they could just sell that fight. Irish versus Russia, Habib Connor too at oh. 35. It would be, it would be huge. And I, like I said, that's what I'm here for, you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if Corey beats Umar. Yeah. Yeah. You never know. You never know. Uh, life since the fight. What is it? Almost two weeks. Yep. When, when yep. was it? About two weeks ago, right? How's it been, man? What, what have you been doing? What have you been up to? Honestly, this is the most back to just normal life. Uh, the fastest it's ever been. You know, I didn't, I haven't really went out and partied. I haven't celebrated, you know, with the boys. I haven't drank. I haven't stayed out all night. I haven't done anything. I've just been, uh, honestly, just been playing a ton of Call of Duty and uh, chilling. Just been chilling. It's absolutely perfect outside in Arizona right now. I have a, you know, I have a farm out here, so I got I got a little trampoline for Elena, a swing by it. I take her outside every morning, and it's just it's perfect out. So I've been been able to hang out with Elena a bunch. Um, you know, been able to. It's so nice to be able to go went went out to eat last night. Ordered half the menu just because I can. Uh, so I've been eating good. You know, I've been sleeping good, which is nice. Uh, been gaming, been chilling, and mentally just kind of ready to get back to work. And, uh, you know, I, I'm this close to greatness. I'm, I'm right there to, you know, where I could be talked about forever, which I've never really cared about because when you're, you know, I've always looked at it like when I'm dead, I'm dead. Who gives a f if people talk about me? But, you know, now that I'm this close to it, I'm like, that's pretty cool. You know, it's, it's, you, you try to find motivation wherever you can find it. When you haven't made it yet, you, it's easy to find motivation because you, you have to pay your bills. You have to become successful. You have to not worry about working. I'm, I don't have to ever work or fight or do anything ever again. So my motivation now is greatness is chasing, you know, legendary status. Legacy, leaving yep. a legacy, leaving your family name behind. I mean, it's beautiful. It really is. I think people will be surprised, Sean, to hear that given the stardom, the level that you've reached, and then you come back and you're just playing Call of Duty and hanging out with your daughter. I mean, that's beautiful. I love that. And that's what keeps you grounded and humble and all the rest of it. Yeah, you talk shit and you're confident, but you've got to be as a fighter. But outside of that, you're playing Call of Duty and hanging out with your daughter. I mean, that's, that, that, that's beautiful. It's You know what? I, I just find every fight camp I go through, every 12 weeks, dialed in, focused, eating good, sleeping good, no distractions. You just have this certain level of peace you find. And then I realize, I'm like, okay, that's, you know, way more life's more enjoyable in that kind of mindset and that peace that I have in camp. So I kind of just try to, I'm trying to replicate that outside of camp with, with, uh, mm. you know, the no distractions and just, you know, going out to the club, it's just kind of, you go, one thing leads to another and then you're, you know, trying to re you, you just, I'm trying to just keep my head straight and focus and, and do what I need to do. And I can celebrate and enjoy, you know, if I want to go out and do all that stuff after I'm done fighting. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, and it's overrated anyway. And you're just going to be really surrounded is. by a bunch of hangers on, ha hanger oners. You know, they're not yeah. your real friends. They're just trying to hang on because you're the champ, and it makes them look cool. Get an Instagram picture. It's all bullshit. It's all fake. None of it really even matters. You're not even like a drinker or a party animal anyway, right? Uh, I've got through. I've I've went through my stages. You know, yeah. I uh, I I've been through my stages. I've been yeah. to the point where I'm just like, fuck, going. It's Friday night. I want to go out with the boys. I want to go to the club. I want to. You know, I've been through my phases that I don't even know. I mean, right now in this mindset, this, this Sean O'Malley, you know, I don't really care to, you know, do that very often. I am UFC 300 is coming up and I, I do host a after party at Zook in Vegas. Nice. Resorts World. So, you know, I definitely, that'll be my first time celebrating, you know, the title defense with, with the fellas. And, uh, so I will go out for that, but in this mindset, I mean, I don't really have the urge to go and, and party and do that. So I feel good right now, but I also know myself. I go through phases. I go through stages and sometimes, you know, I'm hoping I don't have to go through another one of those stages, but if I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, but, um, but going out and partying for a lot of people, that's escapism. It's because they're working Monday to Friday in the bullshit nine yeah. to five job. You know, you, you've cracked it. You're doing incredible things. Your life right now, I'm assuming, is a bed of roses compar comparable to a lot of other people's lives. So you don't need that escapism because your day-to-day yeah. -day life is fantastic talking about the the after party at ufc 300 am i invited or what sean i'm gonna be there oh i'll be offended God. if i don't get one i would love to <laughs> take a shot of uh tequila drink some happy dad that would be incredible 
we're, I'm going to, I'm going to actually go to 300. And then yeah, right after heading over to Zook, better be there. Nice. Nice. No, no, I will be avoiding that like the plague. I don't go to clubs <laughs> these days. Fuck that shit, man. I can't stand uh, it. I can't, honestly, it just, it drives me mad. You're going to shout, you're going to scream. You're like, what, what did you say? Yeah, I don't give a fuck weird. about looking cool with the bottles and any of that stuff, paying over the top prices, like, off. Could not care less. Sean, I'll let you go in just a minute. When this is all said and done, when you wrap up this legendary career, what does that look like? How many defenses cross over to the boxing world? I mean, oh, Ryan Garcia, what the fuck is going on over there, man? Yeah, I mean, ideally, all said, done, end it like Khabib, undefeated, as everyone has finally came to agree uh, that I am undefeated. It's official. It's on my sure dog. I am officially 18-0, 19-0, I forget. But uh, that's that's nice. So uh, ideally, end it undefeated. I don't, you know, that would be great. Uh, I, would, I definitely look forward to defending the title multiple times at 35. Um, you know, whether I go up to 45 someday or not, you know, it's not really necessarily in my plans. I, I don't need to. I can make 35, you know, relatively easily. I mean, I, I make it. And uh, I, would, I wouldn't mind going up and doing champ champ. That's definitely something I would like to do. But I'm not set on that. It's, it is what it is. We're just going to kind of go with the flow. But I do think that Elia fight will happen in the next year. So I think at the end of next year, probably, if I had to guess, that Elia fight happens. But boxing i would love a mega fight i would love a super fight ryan garcia is not an option at this point the dude is absolutely yeah. brain dead um he's probably i'll be surprised if he's around i'll be surprised if he's around in the next few years you know he's not doing good he's not where he needs to be uh he's probably not surrounded by the people he needs to be surrounded by so you know boxing wise floyd's always an option he's you know still running around he's getting older the older he gets the less likely he has of uh, taking right hands. So, you know, that, that's always kind of an option, and it sounds crazy, but Floyd does that. He does ex he does those crazy fights. If yeah. I'm that big of a superstar in two, three years, that fight very well could happen. And uh, so that's an option. I mean, the, the other boxers are possible options, but right now I'm not even – I'm lit, zero desire to box. I'm totally focused I, on just defending the title. But an exhibition match, you could probably do that, though, anyway. be incredible. I would love yeah. that. Yeah. No, no, but I'm talking really about cool. contract contractually. I'm not sure. I don't know oh, what yeah. it says, but, yeah. but an exhibition match, I don't know if it's not professional. Anyway, last question before I let you go, and thanks again for your time. Um, I was actually trying to convince my wife, because I've got to come to Phoenix, a little bit of business. Kids are off school next week, so I said, well, why don't, Rebecca, that's my wife, and Lucas, why don't we go to Phoenix right, and make a little trip of it? I said, I've been there before. There's nice ranches. You can go out on horseback and all the rest of it. Um, She's still got some convincing to do. She doesn't want to spend any extra time with me. But if I did manage to convince her, where would you recommend we go? If we come to Phoenix for a couple of days, what is on the the uh, the itinerary? Phoenix for a couple of days. I mean, um, there's definitely you know great places to eat. You're out. You're in California, so I mean, there's great places to eat there. So yeah. I don't know if there's any better places to eat here. Fuck, I don't even know what there what about is. like ranches and outside stuff to do? We want to get out in nature and see cacti and, you know, and go, you know, yeah, is, I, is there like good ranches and stuff? Do you know, do you, is that not you? Is that not your world? I, I just am not very familiar with that stuff because I literally don't. I just train, game, chill. But if you guys yeah, come out yeah. towards Arizona and you got a couple hours, we'd love to take you on my golf cart. And you'd show you a bunch of the properties around out my house. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, it would be, love that'd to. be fun. I would, uh, it's, it's, beautiful out here so yeah if you definitely come i would love to love to show you around the old neighborhood uh yeah yeah until the day comes you're like oh my god fucking bisping's here you <laughs> fucking showed up it was a half assed inv invitation uh, on the podcast uh no, Sean, full, full invitation 100 percent invitation let me know you're you got a good my man, number you're a good man uh still team sanable 100 percent still team sanable i got my In i'm actually show you real quick i'm building a full size let me turn this camera around here before See if I know how to. Oh um, my! Uh, well, I guess we'll just do it like this. Put yeah, a full size ultra. octagon right here. That kind of oh, I kind shit. of laid out laid out where the the octagon is going to be, so I can get an idea. Put a full size octagon in here. Weightlifting shit. I'm gonna have a uh, yeah. So I got a nice four thousand square foot warehouse I just built, and uh, it's gonna be epic. Is that on your property, Sean? Oh oh, the mic is gone. There we go. Sorry about that. 
Yeah, you're good. So, so, so the uh, the warehouse that you're in now is that on your property? Yeah, yeah. This is on my house, on my property. I'm about to. Uh, I have I have a couple acres. I'm about to buy. There's two two and a half acres I just went for sale right behind my house. So I'm about to just pull the trigger and build a crazy barn dominium house brand like uh kind of like a dream home something just crazy uh because i need it i I don't need it but you know i'm I'm making all this money i'm like fuck i gotta spend it so i'm I'm, I'm about to build something crazy on my property and uh life's good living the dream man living the dream congratulations and everything thank you again for your time I look forward to the sugar show continuing all the best brother boom thank you biz bing my man there he is the one and only Champion of the world. All right, guys, fellas, ladies even, body odor is a problem. You do not want to smell, okay? Some deodorants, they just mask the body odor smell, so it doesn't really go away, but then it's a weird blend. It's a weird mix of smelly, tongy B.O., with a bit of, you know, jasmine or whatever it is that's in the deodorant. Well, guess what? That's a thing of the past now because Mando is clinically proven to control body odor for 72 hours. And by the way, that's wherever you stink. Pits, package, beat, and beyond. Make the switch to Mando whole body deodorant because guess what? As I say, it stops your body from actually creating the scent, okay, for 72 hours. That's three days. Mando will stop you smelling for three days, okay? This is a good way to go when you go to shopmando.com and use the code BISPING. You will get $5 off the starter pack, okay? Shopmando.com and the code is BISPING. Mando products, they reduce or prevent sweat. As I say, you don't sweat, so therefore you don't start to stink. They're natural. They're 100% natural and organic. They are fragrance oil-free. They are dermatologist-recommended and as I said, we've got a good little offer for you. You can get this starter pack for $5 off. That is over 40% off when you go to shopmando.com and use the promo code BISPING for $5 off the starter pack, which actually equates to about 40% off. Shopmando.com and the code is BISPING. Well, there he is, Sean O'Malley. He was on good form, weren't he? Oh, man. Sean is the man. Like, it's, it's, I don't know. It, it's so hard to not like the guy. He just beat up somebody who I consider a friend in Cheeto, and he's he's fun and dynamic and charismatic. You can't hate him. He's a great champ. Yeah, yeah. I you know I had to be very careful because I've got a lot of respect and admiration for Cheeto as a person, as a fighter, of course, you know. But you can't deny that O'Malley was fantastic, and I'm sure Cheeto will understand 100. percent You know, it is what it is. It's a little tricky because they are talking a lot of shit and and Sean's being a bit, you know, did you see that interview that he did with the punch bag on the same couch that he had right there? You know, it's like, oh, you know what I mean? But hey, that's the way it goes. All's fair in love and war. They're both talking a bit of shit. Uh, But congratulations. I mean, look at this guy. He's got a farm. He's got a ranch. He's got a warehouse. I mean, he's got so much money. He doesn't know what to do with it. And people talk shit. You know what I mean? Uh, fair play to Sean O'Malley. Very, very well deserved. So, brings us to questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please, when you send in the questions, you don't have to ask about mixed martial arts. The questions can be about life itself. There is many, many different genres of things going on in life. Yes, Brian? They also don't need to tell me that the question is for you and Anthony. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but listen, guys, uh, love advice. Career advice, you know. Uh, what else could it be, Harrington? Uh, ooh, I don't know. What do people care about other than love and dog money? advice? Yeah, how, yeah, how to make money, how to become a an entrepreneur, how to start a podcast. Hit us up for race tips at the seven at the Aqueducts. How to finish with your girlfriend because she's driving you nuts. <laughs> Relationship advice, you know ooh. what I mean? Uh, break up advice. Did, break up advice break segment advice. from you guys, please. How to I can help with that. <laughs> oh, God. How to dump your girlfriend because she's driving <laughs> you up the bloody wall. Don't take advice from me. I'm still with the same mom for 24 years. Uh, let me see. If you got a question, send it to bympod at gmail.com. And if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating, positive review. It really helps out on those platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and you hit that notification button to find out whenever a new video drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes, you can't find our else completely ad-free and totally uncensored. Head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM14. Get a two-week free trial. Check out over 20 great shows on the network. All right. First question we have here today 
is actually slightly about MMA. It's something that I've always wondered. And uh, okay. this is Seth Bolton. What's up, BYM? This is Seth coming at you from beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. Big fan of the show. Uh, I have a question for Michael and Anthony since y'all have personally been around and worked with uh, Chael Sonnen. I wanted your opinion. Do you think he said spider names wrong on purpose? As like, uh, let me get some tweets, let me get some extra attention, people calling me out. Or do you think he really just f***ed them up? Like, Sergey Pavlovich being Sergey Pavlich is probably one of my favorites. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of good ones. Um, but yeah, I just wanted your opinion on that. Like I said, love the show. Listen to every episode. I listen to Chael sometimes, you know, when I'm waiting on you guys to put out an episode. That's why I got this question. Uh, but yeah, keep it up. Love it, guys. Well, thank y'all, Seth, from South Carolina. And you know, when it comes to Chael Son, I really don't know because I haven't seen or experienced him saying these names wrong. But Sergi Pavlic, that's what he says. I've got to think that he's doing that one on purpose. <laughs> Probably because he's the American gangster and Sergey Sergi Pavlic is <laughs> Russian. And maybe there's a little bit of Cold War uh, trauma going on there from Chael Sonnen. Is there any other examples? Have you heard him doing such a phenomenon? I wish, but I'm just sitting here thinking like Chael is literally he he he's a student of language more than most human beings on the planet. Right. Like he's the one who pointed out that that Connor's the one who made it years of age. And, and uh, you know, Robbie Lawler was the one who said, run it back. Now everybody does. He's always clicked in and listening to these things. So I don't think, oh, I love this. Let's go and talk to you guys about Islam. Makhlchev. Well, how <laughs> Mohammed and Hazmat Chamaya. Arouge versus Ferguson. Procryev thinks <laughs> provider. You, you're not. If somebody needs to get a hold of Provaki here and tell <laughs> who the hell is Provaki? Who's that even meant to be? Um, I'm guessing Prohaska. Provaki. Oh God, that's brilliant. I don't know. Maybe he is doing it just to encourage a bit of uh, back and forth and a bit of comment engagement. Perhaps I found you know a much I mean? longer one. <laughs> Oh, go on, press, just press play for a minute. I've got to see it. We might get demonetized, but it's going to be worth it. It's a great call out. And Darush has finally been recognized with the top 10 ranking Yuri Prokayevs of the world. <laughs> so Paulo Acosta <laughs> sent something out on Twitter. Then Islam Makhlchev. <laughs> Makhlchev. And what that does when you look at the other side of the coin is it puts Usman in a little bit of a tough spot. Usman's and I do right. feel this is an ongoing theme of Usman's career. When I met Kelvin Gaston, a rare, we've talked about this right okay. with Yarir okay. before. Yarir. 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 That's got to be. That's got to be one. Uh, we never talked about this, but of course, we shouldn't be directing you to it. Our competition in this space, of course, is the Good Guy, Bad Guy podcast. Please, what the hell, guys? Right? We've got to win this war. Um, they got the full backing of the UFC. They've got the full backing of the ESPN MMA channel. They get shout outs on every single fight night, but we don't go there. I don't know what you're <laughs> going to say. What are you going to say? I was going to say, dude, next time you're on commentary and they hit the plug for it, I would love for you to be like, believe you me, guys, it's a great show. Yeah, no, I can't. I've thought about that a few times. I'm like, is that Michael? It's not a UFC or, an, or a UFC uh, ESPN product. Okay. You can't. Plug your own shows, okay? I'm not saying a plug. Um, I'm just saying an endorsement of their show that begins with, I mean, believe you me, guys, yeah, it's yeah. great. No, I know. Well, they're not <laughs> stupid, are they? But uh, it is an expression. Um, we didn't talk about this because Chael was talking about how he was confronted in a car park by Francis Ngannou. You must have seen this clip. He was talking about how him and Francis Ngannou were going to throw down. They were going to have a fight. And he came up. He was in his face. And they were uh, getting very close to fighting. Uh, but Chell was with his son. And Chell just said, hey, I'm with my son. Don't do it here. Not like this. And, and uh, Francis just went <laughs> and then walked away. And he was like, I really respected him for that. He didn't disrespect my son. And I'm like, there's probably a little bit of you. That was very, very relieved if this is a real situation. <laughs> if this is a real situation, but I don't think it would be. Yeah, I think that I, I think it's very normal for the losing fighter in a million dollar championship fight to be waiting in the parking lot for a commentator.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Chow comes out with some mad stuff. I'll tell you what, though, we never spoke about this, talking to Francis Ngannou. He did come out recently. Did you see this? Did you see the excuse? Uh, I saw that he said he wasn't himself and that he was he was very out of sorts. I did not see the actual. I've got to be careful because okay. I don't want to be getting confronted by Francis Ngannou in a car park. Certainly okay? not. No way. No way. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm a quote unquote tough guy. I won't back down to no man. You know what I mean? I'm Chris Wyman's walkout song personified. I will not back down. But <laughs> Francis Ngannou loses his shit. I'm taking my two fake knees and putting them to the test. I am legging it. I'll have a good go. Uh, no, he said that he was tricked in Saudi Arabia. They picked him up. They told him the call time was 10.30 and it was about 2.30 a.m. local time. And Anthony Joshua didn't show up till hours later. So because of that, he was very sleepy and he was tired. They tricked him. And it's an old trick that they do sometimes, promoters, if they want one guy to lose, they pick them up. Uh, early so they get tired now granted being backstage can be mentally exhausting this is why i gotta be careful i gotta whisper it i'm pretty sure the thing that made you tired or the thing that put you to sleep was the thunderous right hand of anthony joshua and not showing up an hour early you know what i mean don't say that francis it's not a good look <laughs> do you know what i mean oh dear oh, did you not see that I did. I swear to Just you. Just Google it for crying out loud. I'm not making it up for the love no, of God. I, anyway. I believe you. And I'll be all right. Here is a weird thing. Here's an actual weird thing. I thought watching that fight. The first when he went to fight Tyson Fury, he was in the back with like 25, 30 members of his team. They were all singing African songs and beating a drum and like everybody getting on the same page, getting hyped up like like he knew this was the biggest fight of his life. I didn't see any of that coming out of uh, coming out of this camp. Yeah. We received he said, schedule. we received the schedule, and for some reason in there, uh, I'm there at the arena at least one hour before Joshua. They do this kind of trick to make you tired. I don't. I didn't realize how important okay. it was. I can't <sighs> defend him anymore. Yeah, no, no, no. He's done incredible things. But how, just, early, how early do you show up to UFC event? Like, it's, do fighters don't show up like 15 minutes before their fight, do they? No There's way. shit that hours. has to get done. Yeah. It's hours it's hours before. It's hours. And it can be very exhausting. Certainly. I mean, if you're the main event, which a lot of my fights were, I think there was only one or two fights in my UFC career where I wasn't the main or the co main event. And it does come, it is mentally exhausting. You know, and now granted, you get there a little bit later, but you gotta be there three hours before the event. You've got to get there, you get seen by the doctor, you gotta you you saw seen by the commission again. You've got to do a bit of paperwork. You, um, what else? What else? What else? You've got to warm up. you got to get drug tested. You know what I mean? The drug testing can take a while as well, you know? So do then they you go pull in. Blood? Sometimes, well, no, they don't pull blood. They don't pull blood right before. But yeah, you walk in, they do the arrival shot. You get you walking in, then you got to go. You, you, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. And they want to make sure you're there in plenty of time. They want to make sure that you're not stuck in traffic on a Saturday night at the other side of town and they're live on pay-per-view. It's like, sorry if it's a little inconvenient. We're going to get you there a bit earlier. Now you can chill. And the best thing to do that a lot of fighters do, uh, even back in the early days, you get there with a teammate. Uh, a teammate. I'm talking about on a regional show. Your teammate that you travel down to the event with might be the first prelim of the night. You might be the main event. You still got together in the car. You know what I mean? You just take a nap. You lie down. The experienced guys close their eyes, take a little nap and chill. The inexperienced are running around like this, like a madman, you know what I mean? And talking to everybody, yapping to everybody, going out. This was me going out, talking to everyone, lapping up the limelight and the moment and taking pictures. And they're like, what are you doing? Get back to your dressing room and relax. You're using up a lot of energy. I'm like, this is my moment. I'm loving it. Anyway, thank you for the question. Yeah, Chael, he's going to be butchering them on purpose. Right. Next question we have here is from Kevin Morales. Good morning, BYM crew. This is Kevin Morales coming to you guys from Greenville, Tennessee. Uh, my question today is for Anthony and Michael. Um, I'm curious. I know your wives are a huge role in your life, as mine is. Um, I'm curious if the roles were switched and your wife was the professional athlete, do you think you could have supported her and done all the duties that she has done um, for you? I, 
I know why there's no way I could do all the things my wife does. She, she's amazing. And she's literally watched me turn from a young, from a boy to a man and me turn into a father. I wish I could say I could do her role, but I can't. It's just a dream. But I'm curious to know what you guys think. Do you think if the roles were swapped, your wives would have been as successful? And do you think you could have been the all the time stay at home dad? Um, Anthony, good luck on your upcoming fight. I love the show. Listen to you guys all the time. Y'all have a good day and uh, keep up with those gains. Bill, Tennessee. What was his name? Sorry. Johnny, uh, Jimmy, Paulie. Dude. Y'all, this is just, this is me. Kevin. Greenville. Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> uh, Kevin's a big boy. Kevin yeah. is certainly making those gains. He's taking those protein shakes and. Maybe at least a little bit of testosterone on a daily. You know you're what talking, I mean? You're talking about old Kevin Cena over there? This guy is like, he's wearing the wrestling shirt. I'm pretty sure he's trying for a WWE tryout. Has to be. That dude's too jacked to just be a regular <laughs> yeah, ass guy. Man over there. Hey, fair play. Good question. Good question. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think I could have done. And I don't think Anthony could have done either. Now, granted, we live in a time and in a world where <clears throat> men and women, we can do a lot of similar things. Women can fight in the UFC and they're very good at it and they're very entertaining. I just don't think, and it's not because I'm a misogynistic piece of shit. I just don't think I could have fulfilled those roles. You know what I mean? I think I am a, a man of traditional values and Rebecca is a woman of traditional values. And I just don't think the two would have worked the other way around. And I'm not saying I wouldn't have supported her. I'd support her in anything that she does. All the time, still to this day, I'm always encouraging her to do new things and to try new things and hobbies and do, you know, whatever makes her happy. But in terms of, you know, doing the laundry, cooking the food, being the stay-at-home dad while she was off doing super exciting shit, I just don't think I could have done that. I just really don't. And then that's, as I say, it's not from a a childish perspective. It's just that, you know, I just, it, it wouldn't be that I was angry or mad or whatever. It's just, it's just not in my DNA to be that person. I'm the guy that goes out there and does stuff. And Rebecca has always been super, super supportive. And I think that's why we gelled and why we're still together after 24 years. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think traditional roles need to be still very, very much respected. And Rebecca loves this as well. She always says that, you know, in this modern world that we live in, it's almost frowned upon by some women, some strong female bosses, you know what I mean? It's almost frowned upon to want to be a stay-at-home mom, to want to be a homemaker, you know what I mean? But that's one of the most important jobs that you can do. She has created an incredible home. She's been in the best mother that any person could ever dream of being. She's raised three fantastically emotionally stable children. She's cooked them incredible meals. She's given them incredible love and attention and all the rest of it. And then the flip side, I was off out and about getting the shit kicked out of me, losing eyeballs, breaking backs, losing uh, knees and brain cells along the way and trying to provide a, a, a financial income so we have financial stability. And those roles are very much appreciated on both sides. So to answer the question, I don't know if I could have done that. And, but as I say, it's not because of some weird misogynistic, I'm a man and my wife ain't going to go out and do that. If she wanted to go and do that, I would 100% respect and appreciate that. But she's never wanted to. And I've never wanted the flip side either. Yeah, you know? I couldn't. Um, yeah, I couldn't imagine like the, the, the reverse being true, right? Knowing, like knowing Rebecca, knowing how much she prides herself on her home and like, you know, taking care of things, ceding control of that to someone else and being like, you're Rebecca! in charge of protecting and, and, and cleaning up and maintaining this awesome stuff that we have. I just couldn't see her like that sounds like a nightmare for her to see control of, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I think she might be here. I don't know. We've got a baby crying in the background, uh, oh, no. which is very off putting, by the way. Yeah. Okay, stick a bloody stick a dummy or a pacifier in that baby's mouth. Okay, there's a bloody <laughs> award winning podcast, and we've never won an award, but we could do one day. Okay, we win awards here? every no. year. Oh, oh, fantastic! She's left for an appointment. Sadly, how dare she? Leaving the baby? She... No, 
We don't have a baby, Hamilton. <laughs> There's a one in the house, but it's not ours, okay? How dare she not be here to support this podcast and get abused for two minutes and then me pull the, the bloody thing off her? Jeez Louise, she's off out about just uh, gallivanting around town. While you're staying at home, protecting well, the house. Home. Jeez, protecting the house, sweating my head off because the air conditioning's not on and it must be about 79 degrees outside. <laughs> Ryan, do we have one more question or not? So uh, we have a question that's about MMA or we have a question that could also lead to more misogyny. Well, it, there was zero misogynistic None. remarks from what I said. I mean, there. could lead to misogyny. Well, I will do that. We've got a bit of a family crisis going on at our end right now, so I'm a little distracted, but go ahead. Okay, we're going to go with the lady one. By the way, misogyny isn't cool, okay? No, right? I'm, of course but, not. There's nothing wrong with traditional relationships and, and arrangements in life. And I think that should be celebrated more. What's up, BYM crew, believers? So, quick question. When you and your uh, family or you and your partner are driving, who drives? The man or the woman? Her car, your car, it don't matter. I'm always driving. My old lady hates it, but them's my rules. And, you know, I remember even growing up, yeah, dating girls that had cars when I didn't. If I had my license, I was driving. I think it says a lot about the type of a man, in my opinion, who you are. So maybe it's a question to the believers. Um, get behind the wheel. Be a man. And don't let your lady pump gas. That's just rude. You know, <laughs> that's a bad look. But, um yeah, that being said, I love the show, guys. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, until next time. Man, that's good. We're filled up. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Uh, thank you for the question. And it's actually a really interesting question, actually, because I always drive. I always drive, unless we go to a restaurant and I have, like, two drinks, and I'm like, I'm, you got to drive, babe. Simple as that. Uh, I, I, I think. Brian, can you look up? Can you look up and see if there's a, a stat related to this? It might be hard to find, but on average, who does the driving? I would imagine that in most relationships, the men do the driving, and we go in my car. My, I know you're not going to – I know yours is going to be different, Harrington, but, <laughs> you know, yeah, I know that you're the average man. Uh, it's a joke. It's a joke. Uh, Rebecca has a Tesla. I have a nice Audi S7. So we take the Audi S7. I like the roar of the engine. I like it. It's better. It just feels more manly. I don't like the Tesla. It's a pain in the ass to drive. It pisses me off. I just don't like it. Nothing against Tesla, Elon Musk, Neuralink, any of that shit. Nothing about EVs, none of that. I just prefer the fucking roar of the Audi S7 and the way that it makes me feel as a man and makes my dick grow, okay? <laughs> and I'm driving it. No, go on, Brian. What's the start? So men drive about 30% more on average, according to national statistics, uh, whoever the fuck took that. But, uh, you know, what's funny you said that about Teslas is, uh, I've seen a video of people who drive Teslas and then drive a, like a regular car and they crash them because they don't know to hit the brake. Oh yeah. 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 For anyone that's never driven a Tesla, you don't have a brake. You push the accelerator and then you let go of the accelerator for the, for, it, for the car to stop. If you, if there's no acceleration, it just grinds to a halt. You know what I'm saying? And it sounds kind of complicated, but he's, Rebecca was all kind of like flustered about it. Oh, what do I do? And you, you learn, you learn it pretty quickly. You know what I mean? But now she does say, if I ever went back to a regular car, I think I'd crash because I just let my foot off the, the accelerator and don't push a brake. So there you go. Anyway, that's the show. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Sean O'Malley. Big thanks to Bo Nickel. Big thanks to at... The M Harrington and at B McKay is right. And that's a CK. Guys, enjoy the weekend. Rose Namayunas, the former champ, taking on Amanda Hebas this weekend. Good little fight card as well, so stay tuned for that one. We'll be back on Monday with Anthony Smith. So, see you then. <laughs>